Well, we already released our uh, first boot video and we had about a six minute clip in there on gum leaf boots and uh, the audio was kind of messed up. So we're redoing that and it'll be in the, it'll be in the next boot video that you obviously will see. Um, I had never heard of gum leaf in my life and which has really surprised me because I thought I knew all the boot manufacturers that were made, but gum leaf is a boot that's made in the United Kingdom and uh, they've been making boots over there at this manufacturing facility since 1936. And the reason I'd never heard of gum leaf is because they're custom made by hand for upland bird hunting, which they do a lot of in Europe. So these are not something that comes out of the Orient. They're made in Europe in the United Kingdom and they are absolutely awesome. What is so cool about these is they're 85 percent rubber all the boots now that come out of the orient i don't care if it's lacrosse a task is in my opinion i wouldn't even buy i will, doesn't matter they only last a year or two at the most for me um, but all the other brands that are coming out of the orient they're 30 to 50 percent rubber content and then they use a lot of clay and other fillers you know to to make up the, the, to make up the boots. So they dry rot really fast, they crack really fast. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this here is a browning boot that I bought in the mid 90s. And browning does not make boots, they never did, but they sourced it out of the Orient. And obviously this had a lot of clay content in it because I only wore this a few years before you can see right here. I don't know if you can zoom in on that, if you can see that. That's Aqua Seal. I had to patch them because every time I'd step, in fact, you, when you, you can see that right there. Can you see that crack, those cracks right there? If you zoom in on that really close, you can see where that's cracking up above where I patched it. And that's because it's got a lot of fillers in it and it dry rots. This was probably a 30, 40% rubber content boot, but because it was browning, people bought it, even though browning doesn't make boots. Um, now this here, this here, gotta love that. Okay, this here is a red ball boot. And this is a boot that I bought in the 70s. I actually have two pair of these. And back in the 70s, all the manufacturers, Lacrosse, uh, Rockies, Northern, Service, lots of different manufacturers, Hodgman, uh, they had 80 to 85% rubber back then. Uh, they were made in the USA. Now everything's made offshore. And these, because they were made with such a high rubber content, I've been using these for over 40 years. And the only place where I've had any issues with these, as you can tell, they're, you know, there's no dry rotting any place. I had some issues from climbing trees where I've rubbed the side of the boot on the tree when I'm climbing and descending the tree and it's actually worn through the rubber. So this is gonna have to be patched at some point in time as was this little spot right there. But again, this was a very high rubber content boot. It was probably in the 80% range. And that's why it's lasted so long and I'm still using both pair of those and they're over 40 years old. Now this here's a neoprene boot. Uh, neoprene is phenomenal for hunting. Uh, in my opinion, they're not too good for scouting because they poke holes really easy. This here pair is, they're labeled new. I also had a pair labeled number one. I threw them away already because they've poked holes in them from scouting. Because when you're scouting public land and pressured property in general, you're having to go back in the junk, in the crap. You got to go back where you're walking through deadfalls and sticks and briars and just junk. And ne because neoprene, they punct punctures really easy. Anybody that fishes knows if you're wearing neoprene waders, they get holes in them relatively easy and boots are the same way. These don't puncture as easily because they're heavier neoprene. But you can tell right there, just this, this spring, I got these out, I started wearing them for scouting and I punctured a hole in them already and I patched them. So my neoprene boots, and I own, I think seven pairs of neoprenes right now. Uh, I, I'm strictly using those for hunting. They're awesome for hunting because they're so lightweight. Uh, I wear them when, typically if it's above 35 degrees and up is where I'm, when I'm wearing neoprene, maybe down to 30 degrees. But this one here, I can't say enough about this gum leaf. Uh, they make three models that have these big, heavy duty zippered gussets on the side. And this thing is kind of custom fit for a normal calf. And it has this heavy canvas closure. 
and obviously the gussets are, are waterproof. Um, this particular boot also has a Vibram sole. It has neoprene liners on the inside. There's neoprene liners for comfort. It also has stitched in foot soles, um, five millimeter insoles that are stitched into the bottom. It's not something that you slide out and you know every time you lift your foot out, it comes kind of out. It has inner socks stitched into it also. Uh, and it also has heel pads and everything is stitched in so nothing comes out. And these are, again, 85% rubber content. These are gonna last you, even though they're expensive, they range from $240 to $350. Obviously, this is the most expensive one. This is called the Royal Zip. Uh, but at 240 bucks, these boots are going to last you 40, 50 years because they're not going to dry rot. Um, so you get what you pay for. You can buy a pair of, you can buy a pair of cheap boots, you know, where you pay 100 bucks for them for rubber boots, and you know you wear them out in three or four years, or they dry rot because they got so much clay in them. Or you can get a premium pair where you don't have to worry about poking holes in them, and they're going to last you a lot of years. You don't have to worry about walking through swamps, and you know all of a sudden your foot's wet because it's got a leak in it someplace because of a crack because of the poor rubber content. And I called the, uh, I actually made a phone call to the owner of the Gumleaf USA company and uh, he said he would give a 10% discount to anybody if you wanted to order a pair online. They're really hard to find in stores because they're designed for upland bird hunting. Uh, so not a lot of stores carry them, plus they're kind of high end. He'd give a 10% discount to anybody that ordered them online via this, this uh, boot video. Uh, and you use the discount code BOHUNT, B-O-W-H-U-N-T. So he's given a 10% discount uh, through November, I believe. So basically for this whole hunting season. And there's no, you know, you don't need to spend the money to get the gussets. Uh, the gussets are just something that's a little added extra easier, making them a little easier to get on. But I would just suggest their $240 pair if your budget is a little bit on the lighter side. Um, but anyway, hands down, gum leaf is without question at 85% rubber content, the best rubber boot on the market, period. End of discussion. I just did that video and I forgot to mention, I think I did, I might have mentioned it earlier and we haven't watched it, but uh, my son Joe said I didn't mention that these are handmade. So keep that in mind. These are gonna be handmade for a really nice custom fit to your ankle, heel, and calf. Okay, we got our pack boots out here and uh, these are some old red balls. I've had these since about 1977. I actually have two pair and I'm still using them. I've actually worn this pair out on the side, so it wasn't the fault of the rubber. I just actually wore through the rubber climbing trees because of the bark sliding against the tree climbing up the steps. But uh, most of your good pack boots, they're going to have this silver, silver color on the outside. And basically what that silver does on that exterior, and this is from the 70s even, uh, it reflects the heat back into your foot. And these red balls are really neat because they have a really, they have a, they're, they're not an aggressive heel, they're or sole, I should say. So no mud cakes up on them. Uh, I never have to worry about anything on my steps falling off, you know, moving around the tree. So in, when you're looking at boots, and these are, these are what I wear for when it's like zero and above, zero to 30. I will almost always have pack boots on and I'll usually have a toe warmer over my toe on the top of the sock. But uh, you always got to keep in mind when you're buying boots, you know, I know a, a, a lacrosse or some other brand that's got, got a thousand or 1200 grams of thin slit in the body. It's going to say, you know, minus 40 degree. That's a walking temperature. That, that is totally irrelevant. That temperature rating means nothing. If you're sitting in a tree on stand, you've got to have something that's going to keep your feet warm. So pay zero attention to temperature ratings other than you'll know it's a cold weather boot, but it's not going to keep your feet warm when it's 140 degrees below or whatever, 40, 50 degrees below zero. It's not going to happen. Um, now this is a pair of Rocky boots and these have a really aggressive sole. I bought these in the nineties. Um, I don't typically wear them when I'm on stand anymore because the soles are too aggressive. And these little cleats, these little round cleats, because of the type of steps that I use, they have a U-channel at the top where my foot rides on. 
and if these rubber cleats get caught up in that U-channel, then I lift my foot up to move to another step. Uh, if that rubber cleat hooks in that U and then it lifts it up maybe a quarter of an inch and then it pops out, it's going to make a little click coming back down. So I don't use these Rockies anymore. And you can also tell uh, these are an inferior pack because it's just a regular felt liner, very similar to what Sorel used to have. And this one, this, this is probably the best pack boot for bow hunting ever made. This is the old lacrosse. Um, they don't make this one anymore either. I purchased these in the late 80s and they quit selling these. They sold great, but uh, they were only for northern states. So the numbers uh, weren't there for them to keep, keep manufacturing them. Sold well in Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York. And, but it wasn't enough for the new company that bought them to, to keep making them. They had to have a big, higher number for sales before, so they just kicked them out of the line. But these here have a really nice, well, there's the pack. You can see it's got the silver on it. Uh, the downside of these boots is they're a little heavy. They were, they were pretty heavy. They were really, really warm. They have a lot of insulation in the body of the boot as well as the, the heat from the pack. But it's a really thick pack, pack, and it's also got that silver exterior to reflect the heat back in. Now these, today in today's marketplace, hands down, this is the best, best pack boot made. And it's not that expensive. It's a great value. Uh, these are called Baffins. That's the brand. That's the manufacturer. And the model is a Titan. It's a Baffin Titan. And it has a really nice pack. Has a little bit of insulation in the body of the boot. These are really light. For as heavy of a pack, for as warm as they are in cold weather, they're a really light boot. It's got a seriously heavy pack, though. Silver on the exterior. Uh, these boots, I think retail on these are right around 129 So if your feet are getting cold and you want something to keep them warm, when it gets down there in the single digits, uh, along with a toe warmer on the inside of these, uh, Bath and Titan. There's other boots, I think, I think um, oh God, Ranger made make boots and Bass Pro bought them. Bass Pro Cabela's bought Rangers and they had a model. It used to be called Glacier Bay. Now it's something else. And those are not even close <laughs> in the quality uh, or as far as keeping your feet warm as these Bath and Titans. These, these are the best boot out there now as far as a scent-free boot. You know, you can buy leather boots and Cordura boots with more insulation in them, but, uh, but they won't work for bow hunting. And the reason you have to have rubber, neoprene, or PVC is because if you have leather or, leather or Cordura boots, they're going to have stitch seams along the sole, and air can escape out any time they're stitching. Every time you take a step in, with, in, you know, when you're walking, or even when you're on stand, you move your feet around, you're pushing air. You know, and in a rubber boot or PVC or a neoprene, the only place that air can escape is out the actual top of the boot, the throat of the boot. Whereas in the other ones, they can, your odor can come out the seams at the bottom. So when you're walking on an entry route, you know, you're going to leave odor. You're going to have a scent ribbon all the way to your tree where a deer can smell where you had been if they cross your route. Uh, with rubber boots, as long, I'm a big scent lock guy, activated carbon guy, so I always drape my pant legs over the top of the boot. So every time I take a step, there's a little puff of air comes out the top of the throat of the boot. And the scent lock in the pant leg, which is probably 12 inches draped over the top, it absorbs what little odors come out of it, what little odor molecules come out of the top of the throat of the boot before it gets out, out the bottom of the pant legs. So anyway, uh, for what's on the market right now, Bath and Titan, hands down, the best boot. I have nothing to do with any of these companies. I'm just telling you what's the best. Now I'm going to switch gears to something different. Okay, switching gears from pack boots. Now we're into hip boots. If you're on public land, you're going to use hip boots and waders a lot. Uh, these are some red bulb hip boots I bought. <laughs> Again, these are from the 70s, and they're, they're a neoprene upper. And basically, when you put these on, this here, this here strap goes up underneath your belt and it comes back around and it snaps on here. So it holds, it holds the, uh, 
hip boot up so it doesn't slide down. I own, I still have a brand new pair of these in a box from the 70s. I knew they were gonna quit making them, so I bought two pair, figuring I'd wear them out. I still haven't worn these out. I wear these all the time. Now here's another pair, and these are, <laughs> these are really old as well. And this is, these are made by Service. Service used to make really good quality, sold in a lot of farm stores, really good quality rubber boots. And Service owned Redball. So Service and Redball were kind of the same. And uh, I don't even know why I'm showing you these because you can't get them anymore, but these are rubber boots from the 70s, still work great. If you're using waders, you got to go across a river and it's deeper. My suggestion is if you got to pack in very far, get yourself a pair of lightweight breathables. Uh, these, these don't weigh squat. All the weight's in the boot. The upper weighs almost nothing. Now these, this happens to be a pair of Hodgman boot foot. And for, again, for long walks, that's what you want to do. And I always, I always carry, I wear my regular clothing in when I get to the river. I carry, I carry the waders, I take off my boots, and I put on the waders, but before I, before I put the waders on, or the hip boots, because I'm wearing scent lock pants, I'll roll the pants up uh, inside out, so the, the carbon side is actually on the outside. I'll roll them up as far as I can into my crotch, and then I'll put on the hip boots or the waders, that way, whatever odor there is on the inside of the waiter or the hip boot is not going to be on the exterior of the fabric of the actual scent lock pants that I'm wearing. Then once I cross the river or whatever, then I take the waders off, pull the pants back down, put my rubber or neoprene boots back on and finish what I'm doing. And then I do the reverse when I'm coming back out on the exit. If you're not going very far, or if you just happen to have a pair of neoprene waders laying around, neoprene work as well. Uh, these are lacrosse, the only downside of neoprene, they're a little bit heavier. So uh, that's, that's the only difference. Okay, when it comes to repairing rubber, neoprene, PVC, any of, any of them. This is a company called Seam Grip. They also make something called Aqua Seal, same company. Uh, Here's an Aqua Seal repair kit. There's an actual tube of Aqua Seal. I've used this quite a few times. Once I open it and I seal it back up, I throw it in the freezer so it stays soft. Otherwise, it'll dry out. But anyway, this, this right here is covered with Aqua Seal. And Aqua Seal bonds to anything. I mean, you can just put a dab of it and then kind of finger it around the outside edge. And uh, it's. I don't know what it's made out of, but it's just bad. It's the, it's the best stuff out there. It sticks to absolutely anything. This has been on here for a couple of years. And I mean, it's, it's on there. There's, you can't even pull on the edges at all. Um, so again, seam grip, aqua seal. Definitely what you want to get if you want to repair. Repair rubber, PVC, or neoprene. Okay, we just finished the uh, hip boots and waders, and I did find, when I went over there looking around, uh, this is a pair of lacrosse boots I bought in the 70s, and it's finally cracking. I just noticed that crack. These, these here, I just mentioned Aqua Seal. I'll be Aqua Sealing that this evening. I hadn't used these uh, in a couple of years, and the other boot's fine. This one here's got a little crack where, there, where it was kind of folded over for a period of time. And another thing, I, this is really important. For you guys that are, if you walk a long ways and it's cold out, you know, when it's 20 degrees and below and you're wearing a pack boot, I don't care what kind of boot you're wearing, and you get back to your stand, your socks are damp because you walked a long distance and your feet are perspiring. And if you're wearing, you know, any kind of pack boot, your pack is also damp. Or if you're not wearing a pack boot, the, the inside of your boot is damp. So if you want, to, uh, this is something I learned about 25 years ago. I was on a hunt where I had to walk about two and a half miles on my entry and it was in December and it was cold. It was, I don't know, four or five degrees. And it was a morning hunt and I walked in and man, my feet, I could just tell when I got up into the tree and got settled in, I could just feel the dampness in my socks 
from through my feet. I could just feel it. And I was off stand in three hours. It, it just drove me off stand. My feet just got so cold. And uh, that's before I was actually wearing toe warmers also. But I don't think that would have mattered because the, all my socks, my sock and boot was just wet. So I sat in the hotel that evening because I was downstate. It was a couple hours away. And uh, I tried to think of a way I could get away with that. So I put my boots, I took the packs out because I was wearing pack boots. Took the packs out I took and took the boots and the packs and I put them on a four station dryer. I did a video on dryers. So I had dry packs and I had dry boots the next morning. And what I did is I had some grocery bags. Um, a store up in Michigan called Meyer. They're kind of up in the Northern Midwest. Meyer sells groceries. Well, because I had stopped there the night before to get groceries, I had a couple of these bags, just these cheesy little bags. So the next morning I put on my regular socks. You know, I think they were white at the time, but it could be whatever your street socks are. And I put these bags over my, when I got to where I was hunting, I put these bags over top of my socks and then I stuck them in my boot and I had dry socks in my backpack. So once I got back to the tree, I pulled, took the boots off, pulled the bags off, laid the bags down on the ground, took the sock off. Back then I could balance myself. I took the wet sock off, stuck it in the bag, Again, there's no odor on either side of this bag, so I land that on the ground, and then I took out my dry socks, and I put my dry socks on. Then I put them back in the boots. Now I got dry socks, I've got dry liners, and I've got dry boots. Made all the difference in the world because my nothing was wet. And uh, moisture transfers and conducts cold and heat much better than air. Uh, I said this before, you know, if, if, you, if I had what I'm on, what I have on right now, and I jumped in a lake and it was 35 degrees, probably in five minutes I'd die from hypothermia. Whereas if I walked outside and it was 35 degrees in the air, you know, it would probably take me a couple hours to die from hypothermia. So, cold or moisture just conducts cold a lot, lot faster than air. So having dry boots versus having wet socks and, and damp liners or boots makes a big, big difference. So this is just a simple little trick that will definitely keep you on stand if you're doing long walks in uh, to keep your boots dry. Uh, as concerning socks, you know, socks is a pretty big deal. You know, back in the day, back in the 70s, 80s, you know, they didn't make nice merino wool socks and nice blended socks like they do now. So you just had cheesy little socks that were like $3 a pair for a pair of hunting socks. But now there's lots of companies. Scentlock makes nice merino wool socks. Icebreaker, in my opinion, Icebreaker is the best in the merino wool category. Period. I don't care what what it is. Whether it's a, this is an icebreaker top, this is merino wool. Icebreaker makes dresses. They make shorts. They make jackets. They make they make everything. They actually are based out of New Zealand, and they're the largest uh, merino wool company in the world. Um, they don't really deal much with the sporting goods in the United States, but they deal a lot in the outdoor market, like at REIs and stuff like that. So Icebreaker. In my opinion, hands down, is the best merino wool products out there. Scentlock makes some good ones. First Light makes some excellent, excellent merino wool products, and they're a little more accessible because they sell in, uh, well, I guess First Light's just online. Uh, Icebreaker, you can buy in some outdoor stores. But So you got Icebreaker, Scentlock, Lacrosse makes nice merino wool socks. So, um, you know, that, that'll just help keep your feet warm because mer Merino wool and wool in general will even, it, it maintains heat even when it's damp, even if it's a little bit damp with some perspiration. So like this is a thin pair of uh, lacrosse merino wool socks. I like to get merino wool socks in all different weights, you know, mid-weight, lightweight, heavyweight, you know, um, up above your ankles, up, up above your calves, different weights for, for different applications and for different boots. And another company that makes a sock that I was kind of shocked that worked as well as they do is heat holders. Heat holders, there's really not a lot of technology in it. It's not merino wool, but it's just got a really heavy pile inside and they are really, really warm. It just pockets that heat. So uh, heat holders, 
You know, they're about, I think, 15, 16 bucks a pair, but you're gonna be looking, you get a nice pair of merino wool socks, you're looking at 20, 30 bucks. These merino wool socks here, I think, are $39 a pair. So you get what you pay for in everything. And so when you're looking at boots, keeping your feet warm is a big deal because that will drive you off stand. Uh, boots are really, really an, an important function of hunting and for long walks and in cold temperatures, you know. If you don't have good boots it'll, and good socks and dry feet, uh, you'll get ran off stand pretty good. So look, look for top brands. Um, don't just buy the cheapest thing out there because you're going to get what you pay for unless it's something that somebody bought on a closeout and it's a really special price or something. Uh, look for top brand manufacturers and, and if you see any boots on a shelf and they're starting to get a little bit of a gray hint to them, they've got a lot of clay in them and they're cheap. A lot of companies, they don't make their own boots. Not, a lot of companies don't make their boots. I don't believe Bass Pro or Cabela's own a boot factory. They just source them from wherever they can get them. Um, you know, it's, that they own Ranger, but that's about it. Um, so, you know, try and buy boots from people that actually manufacture boots, not people that just source them from some Chinese company. They walk in and there's 50 different pair of boots on the shelf and they pick out whatever they want from the Chinese company that fits their price point and margins. So, uh, you know, pick one from a manufacturer that actually makes it. Uh, you're going to get a lot better quality stuff. Anyway, I appreciate you uh, listening to this video on hunting boots and socks and uh, waders. I feel it's very important and uh, have a great day. Thanks for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and please like and subscribe.